Dr. Mehran comes to us from uh, Mount Sinai in New York City and has really been a leader in the field. I first met her uh, when I was a fellow um, with Fred Fight, probably about 15 years ago. <laughs> and, and she, at that point, was a leader. And so now it's really an honor to have her here and joining us. And thank you for coming down to Houston. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Barker. Congratulations on this course uh, in this beautiful center. And, and thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I just find uh, the uh, this this uh, research center beautiful, and uh, I think you guys are very very lucky. I think this afternoon uh, the hands-on session is very unique and incredibly important in understanding uh, what's happening in uh, with uh, with structural uh, interventions. This is really taking over, and I think it is really um, apropos to talk about some of the issues and some of the most important complications that could occur uh, with uh, these types of procedures in these sick elderly patients with aortic stenosis. And obviously, stroke is one of them. Uh, important for you to note my disclosures, but interestingly, the only disclosure that I should really talk about is, uh, is my involvement with the, with, uh, the Claret uh, uh, device, which was, I was the, um, uh, medical monitor and on the executive committee of the of that important um, uh, study, the Sentinel trial. But let's talk about the prevalence of stroke after TAVR. There has been some decrease, and everyone is talking about the new generation of devices that are coming after TAVR. Uh, with the first generation of TAVI having pretty high stroke rates. Remember, the early generation TAVIs were, TAVR uh, uh, devices were much more bulkier, um, uh, required more frequently transapical approach, and a sicker patient population in the early uh, usage of those. And as you can see, the first generation did have a higher rate of reported stroke rates of about 4.2%. This has decreased down to about 3.1% based on, um, on, on the uh, studies. But I want to point out, importantly, uh, that the control group of the Sentinel study, which was really looking for, uh, aggressively looking for stroke, had a 9.1% with the new generation of um, of TAVR devices. So in my mind, you see very low rates with Sapien 3 at 1.4%. A lot of this has to do with who's making the evaluation of stroke after the procedure. And I think it's important that a neurologic uh, evaluation by a neurologist does actually increase those incidences. <laughs> if we look at the large population of patients in the, our nationwide registry, you could see that, and this was just presented at TCT with a study population of about 101,000 patients with 30-day strokes of about 2.3%, most of these being um, uh, ischemic stroke. Uh, and I think you could see that the rates are probably somewhere between 2 to 3% in the first 30 days. And it's pretty flat over the years. There hasn't been this massive decrease that everyone is talking about. So I think it's important to note that. The other important uh, piece of information is the timing of stroke. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The incidence compared to SAVR, TAVR versus SAVR. And here's from Partner, the very early study with the five-year follow-up. These were very, very high-risk patients. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, high-risk patients that not uh, uh, that had surgery versus um, TAVR in the high-risk patient population, the incidence of stroke comes at five years of about 15%. These, are, these patients have a high rates of stroke. And it's not something that happens. Most of the TAVR or SAVR-related, procedure-related events occur very, very early. But there is this continuum of risk for these patients from uh, up to a year, a year to um, three years, and then again, uh, all the way out to five years. You see these, the, the risk is not plateauing in any way, and it continues to go up 
and you see that from these, uh, from these trials. When you look at the intermediate risk patients and comparing TAVR to SAVR in the Partner 2 study with a two-year follow-up, um, the rates was about 5.8%, five, 5, 5, 5 percent at one year, up to about 6% in two years. No difference between SAVR versus TAVR in that particular study. And then, of course, if you look at registry data, this is from the Notion study. Um, this is not registry, it's, a, it's basically data from the, uh, from the European colleagues in the Notion trial. They actually show uh, that there is a lower uh, transcatheter, um, uh, 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 stroke related to transcatheter, 2.9% versus 4.6%, but this is not statistically significant over the years. If you actually look at all of the patients, TAVR versus SAVR, in the nationwide inpatient sample database from 2010 to 2014, and even if you look at patients with prior stroke, you're not seeing a difference between TAVR versus SAVR from the national inpatient samples. And I think it's important to note that. What is important is that when there is a stroke after a TAVR, and this is from the partner study, the, um, uh, the rate of um, the periprocedural stroke is a very, very important contributor to uh, increasing mortality, morbidity mortality in this elderly population. So it really is a very important uh, complication as you might have expected. The timing is very, very interesting and different. I showed you from the early partner studies over a five-year period that the continued risk of these high-risk patients, there is a residual risk of stroke, but you see that very, very big blip very early after the procedure. So we have to be thinking about multitudes of different um, issues that could be happening. Acute stroke is the most important complication after TAVR. Most of the strokes, 65% of them, are in the very first three days after TAVR. Up to 30 days, really, really, the most number of strokes are occurring after these procedures. So it is very consistent what we're seeing in our TVT, STS, ACC registry, where we are seeing about 68% of the 30-day strokes are occurring within the first three days after the TAVR, very similar to the randomized clinical trials that have been presented. As I um, mentioned already, there are various etiologies of these risk factors. There's an acute one having to do with um, all of the important patient-related um, issues, uh, valve-related issues, embolization from the left atrial appendage, and um, obviously manipulation during the procedure. The subacute is very much related to nuanced AFib. Um, about 30% of these patients develop atrial fibrillation, and this has been a very, very close correlation with that. And then there's that late manifestation that has to do with a lot of different other um, etiologies, especially patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. So to think about the early cerebral vascular events after TAVR, I think we have to think about the fact that there is a very important manipulation that's occurring during the um, valve procedures with these um, earlier larger device uh, profiles now much better, but there's no question that with positioning, implantation, and of course uh, placement and post dilatation, there is each one of those have an association with some embolization of debris. And importantly, from the, the Sentinel study and from other studies that have had a, um, the very early study of Van Meegan, where he looked at his clean TAVI study, where they really uh, looked at all of the uh, important uh, debris, and there was no question. Uh, they saw some uh, association with the risk factor of tissue embolization, the valve type and oversizing being important, uh, important predictors of the types of t uh, uh, debris that was being found. But what is very, very important is to take a look at what's being collected in these um, filters after the procedure. And if this is from Renu Vermani's work, and you can see that you're seeing fibrin collagenous tissue, but even some valve tissue and uh, 
uh, important fibrin and thrombus and debris being uh, very um, prominent uh, uh, kinds of uh, composition of what's being collected in the periprocedural period. So when you see this, and when you see this much stuff being uh, collected, you're not sure how much of that is clinically relevant, but certainly when you see uh, these, uh, these filters, you are concerned about what could be. There's been a lot of talk about clinically silent brain injury after TAVR. Um, about up to about 80 to 90 percent of patients will have new lesions by MRI after a TAVR procedure. The clinical relevance of this is unclear. There hasn't been very, very good studies, but certainly uh, when you see that new lesions are forming to the orders of about 80 to even 100 uh, percent, you do get a little bit concerned. We try to look at the neurocognitive changes and the lesions in the uh, Sentinel study. The R value and, uh, on this is very weak, so it is important to note that. The R value of 0.2 is really of no value, honestly, and I'm sure that Neil would uh, love to tear this apart. But importantly, silent infarcts are associated with adverse neurologic and, and cognitive um, consequences, and there is some association. You need a lot more data points to make that association more clear because it's very, very difficult to measure neurocognitive function in very elderly patients. It's difficult to measure them on young, active people. It's very, very difficult tests. I, I would probably fail a lot of these. But certainly there is important association with neurocognitive decline. I certainly would not want any neurocognitive dysfunction if I can help it, so it is important. Not, not, new onset atrial fibrillation is a very, very important, um, important issue in our patients. Some of it goes silent and un, uh, undetected and may be uh, associated with these subacute or later strokes uh, if the patients uh, are not evaluated clearly. And uh, the risks and predictors of that is, uh, has very much to do with the ejection fraction, the age of the patient, anemia, uh, important carotid or peripheral vascular disease, and of course, if you use a non-femoral access, which means that these were the very, very sick patients, that's the clear association on new onset atrial fibrillation. When it does occur, it has a very, very high association with stroke, 7.2% stroke rate versus 3.8%. Um, in, this is from the, uh, 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 the, the study, uh, the, 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 um, one of the partner studies. And importantly, for the late stroke, uh, we have to think about this uh, leaflet thrombosis and what's happening at the valve site. There, is, there was this uh, interesting subclinical leaflet thrombosis that was first reported by Raj Makar. For all valves, not just TAVR valves, also surgical valves, where there was this decreased mobility seen on 4D CT on subsequent uh, follow-up of multitudes of patients. It was first discovered during the portico study, but this was uh, further evaluated by Raj Makar and colleagues with multitudes of valves and was found to be of relevance. This subclinical leaflet thrombosis in, the, in, in, the, um, uh, uh, in this study was associated with a higher rates of stroke and a very, very important uh, 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 issue that was seen more frequently with TAVR versus SAVR. And the clinical implication of stroke or TIA or ischemic stroke especially was clearly documented and also in other clinical studies. How do you prevent stroke after TAVR? You adapt the strategy with the timeline of the stroke. And I think we're going to hear a lot about the anticoagulation and antithrombotic regimens, but it is important to think about the procedural and patient-related factors. Think about those predictors and really plan your procedures very, very well, especially for the acute stroke. And now that we have embolic protection devices, it's important to think about that and incorporate that. Um, I think uh, we know that the intraprocedural anticoagulation uh, does not make any difference, and this was Bravo 3. Even with an MRI substudy, didn't show any differences. 
but the peri pre during the procedure, embolic protection can make an important impact. There are several embolic protection devices. The one that the only one that is approved is the Claret device, but the antithrombotic regimens are the ones that we should be really, really thinking much more clearly about. The role of oral anticoagulation is completely unclear in patients not otherwise uh, requiring oral anticoagulation. Although with leaflet thrombosis patients, there was there seemed to be a clearing up of the leaflet thrombosis on oral anticoagulants. There are various multitudes of trials uh, of antithrombotic regimens after TAVR, and I'm going to leave that huge task to my colleague, um, and I'm setting him up for uh, for his talk. Multitudes of trials. We're involved on a lot of them, so. I hope that I was able to kind of put together a very important landscape of what's going on with stroke after TAVR. This is, uh, to me, the most important complication to be avoided. We have to look for uh, the patient-related factors, procedure-related factors, and evaluate each and every one of our patients in their own light, uh, given what their risk uh, profile is. Whenever we can, we should probably think about incorporating embolic protection devices, even though the, the data from the Sentinel trial did not show, it was not, it was not a, um, a uh, powered study for stroke, even though stroke looked to be less, but uh, it, didn't, it was not a positive study to show a difference between the MRI lesions. So despite the growing evidence and the in incredible enhancement of TAVR technology, stroke continues to be an important issue, and we really, really have to think about how to prevent this. And maybe, just maybe, Dr. Neil Kleiman will tell us what we can do to prevent it with antithrombotic regimens. Thank you so much for your attention.